again that thy people may rejoice in thee. Uh, okay, so we've been on, technically it's a five-week series uh, with a few breaks in between, but it's been a five-week series on just the subject of revival. And we're on our final uh, lesson of the series today. Um, up to this point, just to review quickly, for some of you that have not been here, um, the outline isn't original with me. Uh, it's primarily from uh, Evangelist John Van Gelderen. Um, and I based out of this series of messages, which he eventually published into a book called The Revival Journey. Uh, but it starts off, tip, uh, he would say it's not prescriptive, but it's more descriptive of anybody that we see in scripture as far as where revival transpired, or even just if you look at the just uh, regular general history as far as when revivals took place, that it was, you see these series of five steps um, that basically took place when, um, go ahead. When you say not prescriptive, but descriptive, do you mean that uh, if you meet all the criteria, it's possible mm -hmm. there won't be revival? No, in other words. What do you mean by that when you say prescriptive and not descriptive? Uh, I don't see that there's like command that says, you do this step here. You do this step here. You do this step here. Does it make sense? Like in other words. Yeah, but if you, but in, uh, what could you say? Conditions though. If conditions are met, there will be revival. Yes. So wouldn't that be prescriptive? If it's conditional. Well, prescriptive would be it be commanded. Like in other words, you're, you're unless I'm mistaken, it'd be you, in other words, you must do this or else. That, I guess that's where maybe I'm, maybe I'm splitting hairs or maybe I'm just kind of like, it, it might. So would you, to clarify it then, would you say then it would be a matter of, it isn't physical acts, it's uh, a combination of really spiritual readiness? Yes. Um, so if you're spiritually ready, then it could be prescriptive. Right. Couldn't be anybody be what they're supposed to be spiritually? Yeah, actually, that's the call. <laughs> that's I guess that's what we're gonna gonna address today in the lesson. But okay. so, so you agree? Do you agree with that? The statement is not prescriptive, but it's descriptive. Because I think it could be prescriptive if you if you meet the criteria. Because it seems like you take away the promise of revival. You make it a possibility. You do everything, and God may work. But you no, do everything, and God may do nothing. When you make a statement like that, it seems like, well, you know, you know. I guess what I'm trying to address is saying it isn't commanded that you have to follow in this order. But if you are going to see it, this is what will tend. To, in other words, this this has taken place, and then if you want that outcome, then follow this. But it's not like it's, in other words, you're commanded to, you have to do this step at this point, this step at that point. That makes sense. It's not like, okay. Yeah, just, this is a magic formula, as opposed. To, I don't know. Okay. Um, what? I want to clarify what you were saying because I just didn't think that was a very clear way of saying that not prescriptive but descriptive because it's kind of like. Okay. All right. So all right. If you're if you're delineating between the acts or the actions of a person and the heart of a person to do the actions. Anybody can do the actions without the heart behind the actions. But if you're spiritually prepared and these are the actions that are a result of that, that is revival, isn't it? Yes. So it is yeah. prescriptive. Okay. <laughs> 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 
I guess I'm let's stuck write, on the fact that... Let's write that John Van Gelder in a letter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just, I I'm just, done interrupting you. No, 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 that's fine, that's fine. I just, I, I guess I get stuck on the fact that prescription to me means this is a must, absolute command. Whereas, like, when you're given, um... So, you're, are you saying revival is not commanded and it's offered? Is that what the statement means? It's an opportunity, but you can waste your life if you want to. Well, you're obligated to live for God, though, that's the thing. That would be the distinction. That's why I don't want to that statement either. You're, you know, you're obligated to live for God. Let's you're obligated to, live to walk in the spirit. You're, you're actually, well, you're commanded to live in in revival. But I guess, yeah, I guess, you, okay, if you're looking at it from that point, then yeah, you are, you're right. It would be, or it would be prescribed. Then. So let me amend that statement then. It is prescribed. So here's the pattern that you would see uh, that, you, that would characterize. It's usually where you start off as he terms it, there's got to be something more. There's something more. There's something missing. So you feel a need, or there's a need presented to you by the Holy Spirit of God within your life that says, I'm not where I should be, or there's more to life than where I'm at right now. Uh, and usually it's a deep spiritual need. Uh, there's a longing. There's a yearning there. There's not that closeness. Uh, and it could be characterized by any number of things. It could be the fact that You've been walking uh, with the Lord, but you could be closer. You could be as what we'd seen in Revelation uh, with regard to the church at Ephesus, that uh, they had lost their first love. Or it could be even to maybe the extreme of, say, church at Laodicea, that they saw themselves as being rich and have need of nothing. But God told them that, uh, you know, don't you know that you're rich and poor and blind and naked? And then he commanded them, you know, He's eligible to repent, and so they were they were in a condition where he he, he didn't have anything to commend them on. Uh, but you feel yourself in that need, and there's something more. And typically, what happens after that is when you are in that need position, you see yourself in your neediness, you start doing something about it, you start pursuing, you start seeking God. So that would be your next step. That would be your second step. You seek God at that point. And uh, as the Bible command, or the Bible clearly says that. Uh, if you draw an eye to him, he's going to draw an eye to you. Uh, if you seek him, you seek him earnestly with your whole heart. You know he'll be found, and that's 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 a promise. And so, following that is God coming down, and that is God meets with you. In other words, now you sought him, and he's found. Uh, he's found of you, and so you uh, at that point, um, God is actively okay responding to your seeking him out. He draws nigh to you, and um, as we've also saw, this combined with that would be the fourth step, which is brokenness, and that is that when God shows Himself in His holiness and His power to you, uh, in response to your seeking Him, um, typical response that we saw, we saw uh, the examples of John at Isle of Patmos in Revelation, when he saw Jesus. Uh, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Uh, now, mind you, he was the disciple whom, he called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved um, in, in Scripture, when he wrote Scripture down. And uh, he would have been somebody that would have been faithful to the Lord, somebody that uh, even the Lord entrusted his mother uh, to at, at, the, at the crucifixion. But when he saw Jesus that day in the Isle of Patmos, uh, on the Lord's Day, him being in the spirit, worshiping God, uh, heard the voice as of loud thunder, turned around, saw Jesus in his glory, and he, now, mind you, he'd already seen him in his glory at the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Along with uh, James and along with Peter. Uh, but he saw him, and his, his response was, he fell at his feet as a dead man. Uh, and then we see again also Isaiah, same thing, as far as um, call of God to be a prophet to Israel, uh, actually particularly to Judah, but uh, to the nation. Um, and he had been preaching up to that point to chapter 6, woe is you, woe is you, woe is you, woe, woe to the nation, the judgments that God had called him to, 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 to preach. But when he at the temple saw uh, God high and lifted up his train, his glory, you know, his train filled the temple and uh, they couldn't stand to minister, 
um, God in his glory and his holiness, he responded, you know, woe is me. Uh, and uh, there's others that have responded in the same way. Um, well, Job. Job was the other one that I was thinking about in particular that uh, God's own assessment of Job was that uh, he was, you know, there was none like him on all the earth. That he was perfect, he was upright, he eschewed evil. And uh, there was, he really, I mean, he was a sinner, obviously. I mean, he still needed, he still needed salvation. But God's assessment of him was that this guy, you know, he loves me. And so, at the end of Job's trial, Job's personal assessment of himself when he saw God in his holiness after the fact of the trial. Now, granted, he hadn't been restored to this at this point, but at the end of the chapter of, uh, or not at the end of the chapter, at the end of the book, in chapter 42, um, Job had been basically, um, his mouth had been stopped because he had, for a good part of the book, after his, uh, his friends had, had come to comfort him, had been arguing with him back and forth with regard to, uh, he's trying to defend himself uh, with the fact that, you know, I hadn't really sinned. Uh, I've been blameless, but they're accusing him of the fact that, well, God doesn't just curse people for no reason. In other words, you, you, you don't receive trial and, and the kind of things that you're receiving without having done something wrong. But uh, he actually hadn't. <laughs> you know, it was something that got a lot in his life uh, for his growth. Uh, anyway, so he'd been spending the good part of the book just arguing back and forth with his friends with regard to that, and he started developing a bit of a bad attitude. Uh, almost accusing God. Uh, he didn't quite, but he almost started to uh, accuse God. And then God's response to him is basically chapters 38 to the beginning of 42 with just a continual series of rhetorical questions. So in other words, he just challenged them and told them, you know, I'm God. <laughs> and then he his questions, the only thing you could respond with was, well, only you could do that because you're God. Um, and Job, at the end of those series of questions, his own assessment was that uh, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes see at thee, and therefore I repent in dust and ashes. So in other words, same thing as with Isaiah, same thing as with uh, John. What was me? You know, you're God. I'm not. And um, that's the key to moving forward from when God meets with you to being in a position where you are, I guess you could say, revived, you're drawn close, you're drawn nigh. Because uh, when we see ourselves in the light of God's holiness, uh, there'll be sin that'll be present, or there'll be issues that, well, okay, need to be addressed. And when, uh, he terms it like this, when God says break, you break. So in other words, if there's something that is an obstacle or a barrier to being closer to God than what you are presently, remove that. Uh, because it's not worth it, basically, to waste your opportunity here and waste your relationship with God here uh, on whatever whatever foolishness or whatever obstacle or whatever barrier there is. Uh, it's, it's just really not worth it. And so that would be fourth step, and that keeps you, basically, um, as you are walking, as you're drawing nigh, um, to being able to continue forward and moving forward. So now we are, quick review, uh, and fifth would be what he calls life again. And life again is basically when you're in the state of revival. Okay? And what that is, uh, what we're going to look at today is, okay, the outline that he gave, um, I amended it, uh, but it's basically, it, it's his structure, but I, I've, I've kind of filled in the content to it. How it reads and things is you look at okay what is revival so he addresses it like this okay he looks at the essence and then the evidence and then the effect of it um, and so when we seek revival and the thing is we, we're actually called to it uh, in scripture and what it is it's that it's literally the word is just life again restoring to life so it's, it's renewing of life. Uh, so you, obviously you must have had life to have it restored. Uh, but it's a call to the spirit-filled life. Uh, God's 
desire and design for us is that we walk in close fellowship with him. Um, John 15. Real quick, John 15. Okay, John 15, verse 1. It says, I am the vine, or excuse me, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Uh, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Uh, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Uh, for without me, uh, ye can do nothing. Okay, so we're called to bring forth fruit, but it's not our fruit. It's God's fruit. And actually what it is, it's a call to yieldedness. It's a call to, how he terms it here, is abiding. And what that is, it's, it's remaining, it's resting in Christ. It's, it's basically letting Christ live his life through us. Okay, we don't, um, there is a measure where we put forth work and effort, and that's where faith comes in. In other words, God gives commands, and as basically I yield or I trust him, I respond to that, and the evidence of that would be my, my obedience to his commands, you know, because um, he'll, he'll later say, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. And those are given basically not just as a demonstration, but also it's, it's, it's us living out our faith, it's us acting out our faith. But the thing is, it's not my uh, energy or activity, it's God's strength that I depend on to be able to accomplish his work and to be able to accomplish what, you know, what he's called me to do. Um, that's for all of us, that's for every Christian. That's not just anybody that would, you know, be in, you know, uh, quote unquote, full-time ministry, but just anybody. Uh, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna do anything for the Lord, it's, it's his strength that accomplishes it. Uh, in, you know, in Philippians, he tells us that, you know, it's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Uh, and I, I need his strength to be able to do it. He says, without me, you can do nothing. And so we're called to abide in Him. So when we are found, or we allow something to distract us or take us off track to where we're not abiding, uh, we need revival. <laughs> That's basically it. So God's plan, God's design is that we live in constant close fellowship to where we remain in an abiding state. Uh, and that would be the revived life, or that would be God's normal for us. Does it make sense? In other words, we don't. Our what we would think of our normal is that we would be whatever inconsistent, up and down. And we would allow these different things. But God's normal for us is that He wants um, greater works. He wants to do a lot of great things in our life. Uh, but a lot of times we, you know, our own belief, our rebellion, uh, just things that we would allow in our life, don't restrict them from being able to work in that manner in our life. And so we're, his call to us is, you know, abide, come back. And that's, that's, that's basically revival in a nutshell. It's just a call back to abiding, to remaining in him, to, so that we would be that vessel that he created us for that is a tool for him to work through so that he gets glory, he gets glorified. Okay, um, so the essence of revival basically is it's a call to abiding. It's a call to life again, or renewed life, which is eternal life, which is life in Christ. It's uh, just, just walking in the spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? That's the essence of it. Now the evidence of that is you go to Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. We'll go to Ephesians as well, but Galatians chapter 5. Uh, verse 16. It said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, for, the, uh, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, 
and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You know, in case uh, <laughs> you didn't see yours in the list there. Uh, and of, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are, cruci or that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, so... Um, evidence. Evidence of the Spirit filled life. Or evidence of re revival. It's basically us walking in the Spirit. Okay, we're going to be uh, walking in love, joy, peace. We're not going to be fulfilling less of the flesh. We're not going to be given over to um, our carnal desires, but rather we're going to be fighting them. We're going to be yielded to God's spirit. Uh, we're going to be uh, submitting ourselves one another in the fear of God. We're sp submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Uh, we'll be seeking to fulfill Christ's command. Uh, you say which one? Well, all of them. You know? Well, in particular, the one I'm thinking of right now is, uh, you know, go ye into the world, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But it's not just exclusive to that. It's just you'll be looking to see what Christ has commanded and yielding yourself to it because we're seeking again. Um, revival is a call to the Christ life, and that is um, Christ is my life. Christ is. Who I'm living for. It's it's my relationship with Him. It's not necessarily a um, a lot of times when or I, I remember this like in, in, in college was um, whenever it was either taught or preached about. And then this isn't a slam against where I went to school or anything like that, or against even the people that taught me or the people that were that mentioned these things. But uh, a lot of times, whenever the subject of revival would come up, usually. We, we got through like a pretty extensive history lesson that usually went back to uh, 1700s when Jonathan Edwards preached that, uh, you know, sinners in the hands of angry, angry God, and then uh, the first great awakening here in the U.S., and then uh, later on, uh, a number of other different uh, periods of time here in the U.S., whenever you had a uh, large number of people that sought not only just to get right with God, but then also you saw a large number of people get born again. Uh, and were affected in that manner uh, as a result of the believers getting right with God, and then I, you know, uh, being conscientious, conscious of God's command to reach the loss, and also conscientious of, of the need that was around them. So they addressed that uh, by evangelizing, by sharing the gospel, and uh, giving, you know, giving the word of God out. Um, but most people would usually tend to think of and associate the term revival with okay. We're going to see that happen again. Now, a lot of the things that we did see happen in that happened to be particularly incidental to, to then. Uh, like, well, all right. Uh, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, well, in the 20s in particular, then you had prohibition, but then also. Um, you had, following that, great periods where um, John R. Rice, Ed Nelson, uh, J. Frank Norris, um, Dr. Bob Jones Sr., and a number of other guys that were uh, evangelists that were greatly used here in the U.S. Uh, and even abroad, um, preached where they would go to towns and they would be threatened um, not just bodily harm, but just threatened with death, uh, with you know, by bootleggers and uh, pornographers and uh, guys of this of this sort, and they would see lots of people get saved, and then you would see uh, 
because of the large numbers, not just because of the large number, but just the effect of God's Spirit working in people's lives there, that bars were shut down. Um, you know, brothels were shut down. Uh, and you see the, the town affected in that manner um, just because of that. And, um, you know, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a really good thing. Actually, we need some of that around here. Actually, we, not just some of that. We need a lot of that around here, actually. But um, that was just. It's that's not to say that we see revival and that won't happen. Um, but the thing is, the the revival call is not for. It's it's basically to follow the Lord. It's making. I hope I'm making this clear. In other words, it's a call not to the sensational aspects of what we would write in history around surrounding certain revivals uh, that took place. It's a call just to walk with God. And as you follow God and as you yield to Him, you know, the effects of that could be far spread and more <coughs> far spread as you continue. But the, the call isn't to like <coughs> sensational acts. The call is, is to walk with Him. Does it make sense? Like, in other words, you're, you're, um, I would, you know, <laughs> I would really love to see that happen here, uh, where these purple lighted buildings around on Federal and some of, the, some of the other areas around here shut down, you know, because nobody's uh, nobody's giving their money anymore because they got right with God. Uh, a lot of these liquor stores shut down because, you know, they're getting people that are uh, giving them their money, getting right with God. Uh, you see a lot of um, these drug rehab programs. Uh, folks are getting right with God. They're learning to get victory. And so you don't have what large number or what uh, the number of the folks that would be attending those. Why? Because they, you know, they would have gotten born again. They got uh, the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. They get in the Word of God, they learn to have victory, and now they go out and they preach the gospel to others, and then they reach others, and boom, it's like great chain effect, where now all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's God that gives me the victory, not not some 12-step program, uh, which usually they end up, you know, not with everyone, but they never really have true victory. I mean, they have large periods of where they don't regress, but at the end of the day, you know, they're still... In their mentality, I mean, I'll always be an addict. I'm just kind of recovering. Whereas Christ gives you victory. He frees you, not just from its penalty, but from its power. Uh, and though you might have that pull, um, as you know, in 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 6, that I don't have to obey the lust thereof. In other words, I can, I can actually face temptation and walk away because of the freedom that I would have in Christ from it. So I don't have to give in. To, I don't have to give in to my temptation when it comes, you know, knocking at my door. <clears throat> Anyways, so that uh, I wanted to make that distinction was that the call to revival, basically, it's a call to walking in Christ, not to sensationalism or sensational acts that surrounded periods of history when revival transpired here in the U.S. Uh, and not only just here in the U.S., but I mean, there's been times and periods where it's happened all, you know, all over the world. So evidence of it, you'll be walking in the spirit. Uh, go to Ephesians. Ephesians. Uh, well, well, we'll we'll be in first uh, chapter four. Chapter four. Well, we'll start. We'll, we'll start at verse eleven. Okay. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, uh, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, uh, and carried about with every wind of uh, every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 
but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, uh, from which the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the um, of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And then um, verse, skip down to verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off uh, concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And then he goes on and he describes, this is what the new man looks like, is that, uh, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, let the, not the sun go down upon your wrath, uh, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working uh, with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, uh, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Then grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And then let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Chapter 5, we, we see the call as far as the interpersonal relationships with uh, master and servant, uh, children with their parents, husband and wife, in particular with the husband and wife, but um, that's the new man. That's uh, the one to which we are called to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Uh, as Roman 12 put it, uh, you know, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, so this new man, uh, his life living out, that's that's the evidence. Okay, that's that's basically living in revival. It's just again a call to being walking in the spirit, to live in a Christ life, which is, you know, not only just Christ in us the hope of glory, but as in he told the uh, the church of Colossae, you know, my affections, set my affections on things above and not on things of this earth. You know, having my affections, <coughs> having my affections set on those things which are above. Uh, and then also in uh, Philippians, where he talked, uh, Philippians 3. Um, you'd have to start at verse 1 to get the full context. I'd have to read down, but uh, just for the sake of time, Verse fourteen is I press toward the mark for the high prize or for the for the mark pardon. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Um it's pursuing Christ likeness is what that is. Um it's while you're pursuing Christ likeness, you're forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth until those things which are before. But it's pursuing Christ's likeness. That's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's being like Him. It's seeking to be more like Him. And so that is that is my pursuit. And then he says, verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now the idea there of perfect is not like, okay, you've never sinned, you don't have any sin. It's that I'm 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 where I should be for where I'm at. In other words, it's a fitness term. It's uh, I'm not stunted, I'm I'm not um, well, I guess if you're part of the term, you're not retarded. You're not, in the sense of you're not, like, um, held, held, held back. Literally, re retarded is like you're, like you're, in a, like you're obstructed from having, being, a, being able to grow or, or to mature. Um, but um, you're not, in other words, you're not hindered. So you're fit. You're, you what you should be for where you are, like it describes in Hebrews chapter 5, that the believers that were being addressed in the book of Hebrews, that for the time that they should have been saved, should have already been teachers, but they had needed of some, they had need of somebody to teach them or to give them milk. They couldn't even handle meat, the meat of the word. Uh, and that was because they didn't allow themselves to be exercised 
uh, their senses ex uh, their their senses exercised uh, to discern between good and evil because they didn't apply themselves to, to learn to grow. Um, and so this is, again, the evidence. You're going to be pursuing Christ-likeness. You're going to be seeking to uh, not just abide in him, but keep his commandments. Um, and as, you know, walking in the spirit. So the uh, essence of it is it's a call, basically, to Christ-likeness, to live and walk in the spirit. The evidence of it, we've seen well, we could go through the whole, whole New Testament uh, and then just see just where God's commands for believers are. And that's that's what you're going to see. That's, that's going to be the evidence. And then now the extent of that, the extent is basically um, again, Ephesians 4 where we're called to um, he said he gave some apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Um, the idea there is pastors, teachers, evangelists um, were given, well, at least, you know, you got the apostles and prophets. We don't have those today. Well, we do here. Okay. We don't have any living apostles and prophets, we have them We have them here in the Word of God. Okay, that's the foundation. That was the foundation that was laid and they're here. It's the Word of God. Um, but what we do have remaining is evangelist, pastor, teacher that are given as gifts to the church to perfect or to mature, to grow the saints, everybody, so that the saints, along with pastors and, or pastor, teachers, and evangelists, or to um, work the ministry. In other words, they're supposed to be engaged in or involved in the work of the ministry. So it's it's an all-inclusive. In other words, it's not exclusive just to evangelists, pastor, teachers that are engaged in the work of the ministry. It's everybody, all together. So they're given as gifts. They're called, and that's pretty evident because he says he gave some Okay, so not everybody has that call or has that responsibility of, of being evangelist or pastor teacher. Uh, though we are commanded to evangelize and though we are commanded to seek to be faithful and though we are commanded that as we mature, the older we are, we are to teach the younger. Uh, in particular, I know that with the women, as far as the older women, they're supposed to teach the younger to, to love their husbands and, and take care of the home and, and those things, but also as maturing believers, those that are maturing, that we seek out the younger, and you were your spiritual restore such a one, as far as ones that we see that are in sin. Uh, and, you know, so we have responsibility there, but as far as, particularly as far as being called as a pastor <laughs> to pastor or worker, as an evangelist, that's obviously God gives some um, but the thing is, the work of the ministry itself, which is reaching people for Christ and seeing them grow, maturing Him, is given so that all of us are to be engaged and involved in that. Uh, it's not exclusive just to, okay, what would be considered the, the leadership. Uh, there's really no division necessarily between leadership and lay personnel, uh, as some people like to term it, but rather we're all engaged, we're just not tasked with the same responsibility, but the thing is we're all supposed to be actively engaged in seeking to fulfill them. Uh, the work of the ministry. That's, that's what God's call is. So the extent of that is going to be as we yield, as we give ourselves to service, you know, whatever God works, <laughs> you know. I could be limited to just our sphere of influence, and God could grow and extend our sphere of influence to expand beyond just you know, our friends and relatives and co-workers, but even regionally, within our city, within our county, uh, and, you know, even some to maybe nationally or worldwide, uh, as the case may be, as God as God sees, but it's not it's not exclusive or not really limited. Um, that's, and I guess in effect is really it's God's doing, and we are called in Hebrews 
tend to provoke one another to love and to good works. So the extent of it is basically as you limit yourself by your obedience to him and I guess as, as God allows opportunity. Uh, so that you're not really, there's no really limit to that. And the extent of it basically is as far reaching as people respond uh, to God working through you. Uh, you know, and the only shackles to that is a person's <clears throat> unbelief. Um, and not necessarily yours. I mean, if a person doesn't respond <laughs> to God's call, that's, that's on them. But you still, as you yield, you still have influence that you're still able to, to, you know, have God work through you to affect people. Okay. So in summary, um, again, revival. What is it? It's a call to Christ likeness. It's a call to walk in the Spirit. It's a call to life again, walking close and abiding in Him. Um, what does it look like? It's me, not fulfilling the lust of my flesh, but me, walking, me rather walking in the Spirit. And then the extent, the effect that I'll have, honestly, you might see here, but we may not you know, know until we get to heaven. You know, I don't know. You know, you give a cup of cold water in his name, you know, he'll give you reward. You really don't know as far as, I mean, you'll see, you're going to walk in the spirit, you're going you're gonna to have people be affected. You know, Apostle Paul, when he, when he went out and he preached the gospel, uh, some believed, some didn't. You know, um, he was able to see scores of people saved, but at the same time, there was places where he was run out. Um, he was stoned. He was, you know, countless, countless times threatened. Uh, and there were places where, um, as I guess, this is more with Jesus. But the thing is, where as as Jesus said, you know, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So in other words, God's power was restricted in the person's life, not in the person yielded to God, but rather in the people that he was trying to affect, or God was trying to work through him to them because of their unbelief, their unbelieving response to God's work. So, um, you know, just keep walking for them. You know, living for the Lord, keep walking in him. Uh, we are called to, obviously, again, walk in him, walk in the spirit. And the key to not only just okay seeing revival in your life and living in that is basically when we see our need respond obviously seek God but when he brings when he responds and he draws nigh um, and he brings whatever that might be an obstacle to your attention you break you yield you remove that so that you can be restored to be used greater and to be in a constant state of abiding and living so that his power flows through you, his life flows through you, so that you can have eternal impact here and now in the limited amount of time that we have uh, for our life here. All right. Does anybody have any questions? I know it's kind of a lot and it seemed like it was kind of rambling, but that was more of a review. And that was, that was, that was really more the intent of the lesson was more of a review. Um, no questions? Alright. Um, Brother Taj is going to be bringing a series on creation um, for the next few weeks. And um, that's going to be uh, Sunday school, basically, for the next. Uh, how long is your. Is it three or five? Four. Oh, four. Okay, all right. So for the next four weeks, Brother Taj is going to be uh, instructing us with regard to creation. And then following that, uh, we'll be doing the series on prayer. Uh, I'll be doing a, a series on uh, prayer uh, with regard to just, not just what the Bible says about it, but what, you know, we define it. That'll be our first lesson. Okay, what is, what is prayer? And then we'll go and analyze as far as what scripture has to say with regard to how to pray, um, what kind of prayer, you know, intercessory prayer, we'll be addressing that in one lesson. Um, and 
uh, if you have any questions or you have any kind of like suggestions with regard to that, the things that you would want to know, then you know I can I'll, I can address that also. But um, no questions. Okay, we're uh, dismissed.